12, 13 years now. So uh, I feel like I am disconnected. 12, 13 years back before Haskell was popular. Before? I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Haskell has been popular for a while, but only amongst computer science academia. <laughs> you know, so not really amongst industry, but yeah, yeah, before it became popular in the industry. So yeah. So yeah, so I have this disconnect with uh, you know students. So I really wanted to meet all of you guys. Right, I can keep the talk as short as you want, but I really want to know, you know, what do you guys think? What do you, what are the hip technologies that you're working with? You know, that I'm totally out of touch with. <laughs> okay. Tell me when this starts. It's okay, so yeah, so I'm gonna give you an introduction before this starts, as to not waste a lot of time. I don't know how it starts. Button press. Uh, all of you have heard of computer science? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all of you know what computers are. <laughs> so, okay, that's good now. So, <laughs> so okay, so I uh, am Anupam Jain. It's uh, everything set, right? Okay. Well, I'm going to wait for this to come out, but I'm going to give a brief introduction until then. Uh, I'm Anupam Jain. I am a functional web developer. Okay, I do web development. I mostly use functional programming technologies. So if you're a web developer, if you're a database developer, if you're a functional enthusiast, right, this would be relevant to you, right. It's also going to be relevant if you're interested in maths, okay, because what I'm going to show you is that SQL is very mathematical, it's very, uh, it has a, a very mathematical uh, basis for it, right, so, uh, and, and I'm going to tell you why it's beneficial, why do you care about that, right, a language is just a language, but why do you care about the mathematical basis for it, right, so, so, uh, yes. So, how do you explain the functional paradigm before five years That's what I was going to do. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, I'm going to start with, and I wish we had more time, but I'm going to start with basics of FP, basics of SQL, and how they come together mathematically, okay? Very simple basics, and we can gloss over things that you guys think are easy, and spend more time on things that you think are not easy. Uh, so, this is about type safe functional SQL, right? And this is about me. I have a GitHub page. I do open source development also. I currently look at SAP Global. As I said, uh, we are hiring functional programmers, right? And I'm very interested in talking to students, figuring out what they're interested in, you know, and you know, bridge that gap between industry and academia somehow. So I'm really interested in that. Uh, primarily, as I said, I am a web developer. Uh, I develop financial applications. So this is uh, we have a bunch of products. Uh, we do financial web application development, uh, and it's very very functional. Uh, stack oriented. Uh, two things that I'm going to focus on are analytics and reporting. Financial analytics, financial reporting. Okay, I'm going to tell you about those things. I also organize a meetup group called FPNCR, which is for functional programming in all of NCR. Right? We try to organize regular meetups, so if you guys are interested, join this Telegram channel. Right? And we also have a meetup page, the URL is too long, I didn't put it here. Oh my god, okay, so functional programming 101. Right? How many people have heard of functional programming? Okay, know what functional programming is? Okay, just one. <laughs> so functional programming is basically programming with functions, right? It's declarative in the sense that in a normal programming language you would have step-by-step -step statements. You would say x is equal to 1, x plus plus, right? Increment x by 1. Functional programming does not have any of that. Functional programming is all immutable data. You have x is 1, y is 1, but x and y cannot be changed later on. Right? Don't think about why. <laughs> we don't have a type of why, but uh, that's what it is, right? Immutable data structures. Uh, and then finally, the most important thing that I'm going to focus on is strong static typing, which means x is an integer, it will remain an integer, it will not become a string. There's no implicit coercion going on. What languages are you guys most familiar with? Uh, programming languages. Java, Python. JavaScript, okay. And you have also done a little bit of pure script, right? Okay, so yeah, so all of them are, uh, except pure script, are uh, statements executed sequentially. Uh, they don't have, any of them uh, have a strong static typing. Java has static typing, but it's not strong, right? Uh, it doesn't have a bunch of things that uh, are there in languages like pure script. Uh, so I don't have time to go over that, but uh, this is the core of functional program. This is all you need to know for the entirety of today's talk, okay? 
So you have prohibitive types, integer strings, booleans, no complication there, right? You have user defined types. I'm not going to go into it, but know that there are things called user defined types. You can define your own types. You can think of it like classes and subtypes and things like that. So for example, user defined type might be uh, a person can be an administrator or a normal user, right? So you have those options there. So you, in a normal language, you would define a class called person. Uh, it would have subclass administrator, subclass user like that, right? Uh, then you have functions, normal functions. The only restriction here is functions can't uh, change things, can't change the values of variables, function can't print things, function can't do anything that will have a side effect, right? Uh, function application, you have a function, you have a value, you apply that, right? Any complications still here? Okay. Finally, what you have are higher order functions and combinators. This is if you understand this, then you would know why function programming is good, right? So let me show you an example of a higher order function. Uh, if I have a function, uh, so this is an anonymous function that takes a value x. This is a syntax for anonymous function. It takes a value x, multiplies it by 2, right? Uh, this is a lambda syntax. This is the slash is a close approximation for a lambda. Okay? And then we can have a higher order function that takes a function, for example, this function literal, Right and applies it to a value. So it now this might require some uh, explaining. This is called type signature for the function. Okay. So what it's saying is that anything after the double colon, that is what the function is expected to do. So this function called hash is expected to do this. It can take something a. I have not specified whether it's an integer or a string or a boolean, whatever. It can take a function, ignore that for now, and give you something called b. That is how you should look at it, right? Uh, split the type signature by arrows, and everything except the last thing are the arguments. The last thing is the result value. So now you can look at this function. This function is basically it takes an A and gives you a B, right? So can anyone tell me what this does basically? What just by looking at the type signature, what do you think this thing does? It takes an A. It takes a function that takes an A and gives you a B and then returns a B. So it's basically an apply, right? So this is the only higher order function that we use, uh, but it's an important higher order function. So you mentioned know about it. Um, what use does it serve if I apply something directly versus... Yes, I'm going to tell you. I'm the, so I'm going to use it later on. So just remember what the definition is. Remember the order. So this is like a... It flips the order, right? So instead of... You specify the function first and then the argument. It takes the argument function first and then the function. So it's just a way of specifying it in a different order. Right? That's all you need to know. So these are examples. Uh, and x is 2 is a simple value, primitive value. This is a function that we can define with a name. So it's not an anonymous function. We are saying double takes an x and returns x into 2. Right? And now that you know what signatures do, so you can see that this is an integer to integer. Right? Uh, you can apply it to a value. When you apply a function to a value, it takes all the arguments, remove those, and the last thing that's left does the type. So if you say double 14, it becomes 28, and the value is type of 8. Okay? Uh, plus is a function that takes two integers and gives you an integer. Plus is also a combinator. By combinator, it's a very broad term, but what I mean is it takes two values, produces a third value, right? Or may more than two values, maybe also. Binary operator? But more than two values also. So it doesn't have to be binary, right? So it can do 14 plus 14, it can do 14 plus 14 plus 14. Every so atomic step will be binary. Sorry? Every atomic step will be binary. Yeah, yeah, but is that there is some sense of concurrency? No, 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 no. So you're right. So when you're adding numbers, then every individual step is going to be binary. But plus is just an example. Okay. What I'm saying is, combinator is defined as something that takes pieces, combines them together to make one big thing. That's how I define a combinator. It could be two or more values. So an example which is separate, different from numbers, the usual numbers that you see, is how do you combine lists together? So if you have a list one, two, three. Right, and then list 4, 5, 6, everyone knows lists here, right? Then you can combine them together with this operator, which is kind of like a spaceship operator, but it's called append, it appends two lists together. 
So you can say 1, 2, 3, append 4, 5, 6, it will become this. Okay, so it takes two lists and returns a list. Now here, huh? uh, so uh, now here is another one of the final pieces of information that you need to know about functional programming and you're done. Okay, is that a type can also be parameterized by another type. So here we're saying it's a list of integer, right? It's a list, but it's a list of integer. Does anyone know about generics in Java or I'm not sure Python has it, but Java has generics. This is what Java generics does. So you can say a list, but a list of something. So you have to specify that something also. Right? So the type of append here is list of integer, another list of integer. You can't specify a list of string here. It will not join together a list of integer and a list of string together. Right? So this is kind of like a tag which says that I need to make sure that they are of the same type. Right, and it will give you a list of it. Done. Functional programming done. You guys are experts now. <laughs> okay. So these are examples of uh, type errors. So as I said, it's statically typed. It's at compile time. Uh, you can imagine that it will save uh, you from bugs later on at runtime. So if you try to double A B C D, JavaScript will probably give you A B C D A B C D. Right, but strong statically typed language like JavaScript do not. So that's an example. Now this is a good example for lists. This thing, list uh, says that the two lists that you pass to it have to be the same type. It's A and A. And it gives you back a list of the same type. Right? So if you try to add a list of integers with a list of strings, it will not combine. Okay? Probably languages like Java also. Even though Java is strongly uh, statically typed. But because if you put something in a list, it will make it an object. It will cast it to an object. It can do wrong things with it. But PureScript, Pascal, those things will not. Right? So that's uh, an important thing. Okay. FP done, we're gonna use it later on. How many people are familiar with SQL? SQL. Use it. Yeah. Okay. So SQL is uh, for relational database management. So you have relational data. Um, do you know what relational data is? So what is relational data? It's stored in tables. Uh, yes. Uh, we have primary keys and other also. Uh, right. So there's foreign keys there, right? Okay. So it's but how does it get the name relational? Basically, all the values in a table are related to each other. So like a table could be a person table. It would have name, age, whatever. They're all related because they belong to the same person. That's how it's relational. And you're right, it has primary keys, which are unique in a table, it has foreign keys, which are common between tables, things like that. Now the thing here is that relational uh, queries in the form of SQL are also declarative, they are also immutable. You can't change data in the middle of a SQL query. Uh, and they are based on sound mathematical theory, just like functional programming. Okay, so this is a very good fit for functional programming. But people generally don't use it that much. Uh, but we are trying to do something like that. So uh, the relational theory that it's based on is called Clark's relational model, which is what we just said. In a table, values that are related, you can join them together uh, based on foreign keys. Uh, all the columns are typed. So if we get typing here, right? Uh, all the tables have a set, and by a set I mean these are unordered. Uh, elements in a table. So you can't, uh, a table doesn't define the order of entries in the table, right? You can get it in any order except when you specify a specific order, right? And it can refer to other relations using foreign keys. Example relation from Flintstones, whoever recognizes that. <laughs> okay, so we have a name, age, and you have a spouse. Spouse is the foreign key that refers to the ID of the uh, same table. Any problems here? So far, no? Yes, you can probably skip through SQL quickly. Everyone knows SQL, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay. So, you can do selection with a where clause. You can do uh, not null checks, right? You can. Okay, so this is pretty much all I had on SQL here, right? You have SQL. Uh, what we have seen so far is uh, very suited to CRUD. 
uh, which is you can uh, you have application where you can create data, delete data, modify data, read data. So relational databases are pretty good for CRAD. Uh, but when you start following that CRAD model all the way by adding more data to each table, then you run into some problems. So you get into uh, normalization, right? So you have separate tables for separate aspects of the data, right? So you divide into that. I'm going to gloss over all of the things that I have here. Uh, but given this model, if you had to now write a query to get all the children uh, of a particular ID, right? So let's look at this. So given any ID, let's say I say two, right? Give me all the children of Barney, right? So then you would have to join two with this table. Right, and check if 2 belongs to any of these columns. Yeah. We find it here, so we get the ID of this person, 6. We get the details, 6 is man, man, right? So that's how joins work. You write that way like this. This looks very nice, very clear when you look at it, right? What about when you have to uh, get all grandchildren? Okay, <laughs> so imagine the table is pretty big. Sorry? Yeah, exactly. So you would have something like this. now. Complication is then the easiest way to write it is have nested queries, right? Mm -hmm. So or two joins. That is also another way of doing it. So you can write it. Now we can see some duplication here, like this thing is identical between the two faces, and we still haven't generalized it. What about when we have to get n ancestral information? What if I say get me all children, all descendants three levels down? Right? How would you write a SQL query like that? SQL doesn't offer us any tools to do those things. It doesn't offer any tools for abstraction. You have to write every query from scratch, right? There are things like functions, uh, views, but they have their own problems. I'm going to discuss that, right? And what about things like aggregating information? What if I say, give me the sum of all ages of all the descendants of a person? How, how would you begin to write a query like that, right? So there is the one problem is that it's not abstracted enough for you to immediately come with a solution. Like if I asked you to write it in Python, for example, you'd be like, I'm going to iterate over all the people, get their children, add their ages, get their children, add their ages. You can think of it in your mind, right? Can you think about a SQL solution like that? Probably can't, off the top of your head, right? You can obviously write one, but it's going to be more difficult, right? So SQL quickly becomes messy. That's the problem that you can solve with abstraction, uh, and we don't know how to abstract it further in the current model. So we need to abstract this concept of getting all children of a person, right? You would, you can do processing in Python and then create SQL queries that way. You can do processing using stored procedures, nested queries, SQL functions and views. Uh, performance is a problem with most of these because what the relational model, what database model looks like is this. Is this clear? Can everyone see? Yeah. So every query that you make will have two layers. There's going to be a non-relational thing around it, and the core is going to be relational. And the only thing that the database will optimize is the relational data. Okay. So anything that you do beyond relational data, selects, uh, subqueries, joins, anything that you do beyond that is not going to be optimized. Right? Functions may or may not be optimized. It's very hard for our database optimizer to optimize lots of function calls. Right? So performance wise is a problem. Also, relational algebra, anything that you do in the relational algebra can be easily transformed from an inefficient query to an efficient query by you, by the database optimizer. So it's always better to keep everything in one SQL statement rather than doing processing around it. Right? So what Ermine, and I'm going to come to Ermine now. What relational algebra allows us to do is uh, do a lot of processing inside that relational code, uh, and we have built tools to do that for you. Okay, which is strongly typed functional, uh, and I'm going to explain how that, how those things work. Right, so it provides these four tools: projection, where you select some columns, it's basically the select thing. Selection, where you can select, you can filter on some rows, so you can say that. I want all people who are not yet 40, for example, right? And you will get only three things here. It also allows renaming columns. So I can say that I have this table, I can say rename the person ID to ID. This is not a permanent change. This is just uh, something like uh, 
writing x plus 1. You haven't changed the value of x, but you have another entire value which represents x plus 1. The same here, when you rename the table, this table still exists, right? But you've renamed the column and gotten another table. And similarly, you can join two tables together, it gives you a third entirely new table. As I said, functional programming is immutable data, so it's not about changing things inside it. Uh, so, when you combine two things together by a join, now we're joining on the ID uh, column here. So, it creates an entirely new table. Okay, so if this is the table, how would you write it in relational algebra, the same way, right? Uh, this is how you would write it. Now here, you see the hash. Okay, so this is what happens, okay? So we'll take a children's table, right? This is the table. Now we are applying, and now you see why we use hash, because hash allows us to build a pipeline of sorts. So you take a value, you say apply this function to it, this will return a value, apply this function to it, this will return a value, apply this function to it. So it allows us to build this pipeline. Does anyone uh, find that confusing how, how pipeline is built? No, I can type it and show it here. Or this. But this doesn't seem much more simpler than... It doesn't, yes. For that query it doesn't, I agree. But what it allows us to do is abstraction, right? So what it has done is that at every step, you have something which is independently analyzable. You take the children's table, you filter it according to some criteria. You get another table. Right? You take that filtered table, you rename a column, you get a separate table. You take that table, you join it with another table, you get a third table. At any point, you have those abstractions open to you where each step can be analyzed separately. Yes? Did you answer? No. I thought you raised it. <laughs> So, so uh, when you're building large pieces of code, having independently analyzable lines of code are invaluable. Because what will happen is that you will say, you have a variable x, you will say x is equal to x plus 1, x is equal to x plus 2. Now, the second statement depends on the value of the first statement. That depends on the value of the previous statement. Right? Here, these things are independently analyzable. I can take this entire thing, put it in a separate function altogether, and reuse it in other places. Right? Whereas I can't abstract away statements that are supposed to uh, occur sequentially. So if I say x is equal to x plus 1, I can't put it in a separate function and call that 10 times, because that changes the value of something 10 times. Whereas this just gives me an independent table that I can independently analyze, and if I don't use it, it doesn't get produced. Right? Uh, so that's what it offers over sequential processing. Uh, what it offers over SQL is that you can look at this, you know, you know there's no bug here, because this is pretty clear. Right? So you can look at that as a black box, and then apply this, and then reason about it. Right? What does is, what is my table state look like? Right? You can look at this and then reason about it, what happens when I join it with something. Okay, and I'm going to show you more advanced examples. Uh, so yeah, so, I was going to go through row types. I don't know how much time we have for this. Uh, I would say we have about 10. 10 minutes, perfect. 10 minutes is more than enough. <laughs> okay, so yeah. So, I, I can discuss more of why this is better than writing SQL, right? Uh, but let me just quickly give you an overview of row types, what uh, it gives us more than uh, just convenience, right? So, um, what uh, we get with the functional SQL, uh, and I'm still not using the word ermine, that's a language that we created to provide us this, okay? It's a completely separate programming language in Haskell uh, and Scala. So, it has a Scala backend and a Haskell backend. And it provides Haskell's tools, uh, Haskell's features plus row types. And I'm going to explain what row types are. Okay. Uh, so we discussed this kind of programming, right? But one thing that I haven't mentioned here is uh, strong typing. What our goal is that if I say instead of father, I, for example, write something else. I, I have a F A T H A R, right? I misspell it. Right? I want there to be a type error. I want this code to not compile. 
right? If I, instead of father, I forget that I'm supposed to say father and mother and not, I, I write parent, for example. I want my code to not compile. But that's only a problem in, in not even in Python. Maybe that's a problem in Python, but not in, in C++ or Java. Like it won't compile if you misspell a token. Yeah, if, but, uh, I'm actually not sure which library I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. In general, if you have a object x and it can it only has x dot a, b, and c. Yes, I agree, but here we don't have an object x. Here, this is not an object with properties father and mother. Okay, yeah, effectively if you have an object then if you access some non-existent property then it will give you an error. Right, but this is not an object, this is a relation, this is a table that may or may not have those properties. Uh, see, if you have an object with a property called father, you can say something dot father and get the value of that out of it, right? This is something that represents the computation that you will do later on, right? This is basically the result of taking the children's table running some computation on it and then you will get some values out of it but you don't have access to those values at this point right we are building computation we're not we don't have access to the actual column values inside it so yeah but if you think of it in an object oriented way then yes that's what it would be but what about we read at this point we have a children table we filtered some values it's still the same table same columns we rename person id to id and then if later on I do join on ID, right? If I type person ID here, it will still give me an error. Because it knows that at this point we have renamed a person ID to ID. So it's strongly typed at every step of the way. It's not possible to not do that. It will also give me an error if person did not have an ID. Right? Because join checks that whatever you're joining on has to be present in both tables. And it knows that the result will have that column only once, not twice, for two tables. So we want that kind of strong typing, right? And what the, this allows us to do is things like this. You can write a generic filter. You can. This is a function that takes. So when I say relation, think of it as table, right? It takes a table, any table, with a column age, which is an integer. Right, allows you to filter on it so that it only returns rows which are uh, age greater than 40 and it returns the same table back with the column integer. Right, so it allows you to write a function like this and later on you can use it inside any query at any point of time. You can have a query uh, which does some processing and put that function on top of it uh, and you will get that filtered by this oldies thing. Right? The problem happens with something called loss of information where now the typing fails here, it fails us because as soon as you do oldies on person, right, it has forgotten everything it knew about the person table because the return type of oldies only specifies agent. So it has forgotten everything that it has a name also. It doesn't know that anymore. So what we added to Irvine in, apart from Haskell is that it allows us this extra parameter uh, which is polymorphic. This, these are called polymorphic parameters when we don't specify what they are. We don't specify this an integer, string, boolean, whatever. We just know that there is something there, right? So we now are saying that this is a table with an age of integer type and something else which we don't care about. And then we will return that same thing with age of integer and uh, so it's a typo here, it should be the same in both, right? Either F in both or S in both. F is for fails, right? I don't know what I'm thinking about S, but it should be F, I guess. So we will return the same thing. So this is that polymorphism. For example, a pen can take a list of some type, a list of the same type again, and it will necessarily give you a list of that same type, right? When we defined a pen, we did not specify that it only takes a list of integer or a list of string. Similarly, this doesn't know what table it will be passed, but it knows that it will have at least an age column and it will return that age column, right? So this is an important thing that was added. Uh, this, this, these are called root types 
Okay, so Rotax is a pretty advanced type concept that is actually pretty simple, but because you've come at, come at it from the Haskell side, which is already pretty complex, it becomes very complex, but this is all it does. Uh, and you would say that things like Python and all already have this, because that typing, right? So, <laughs> Python, you can take any object which has an age, modify it, and it doesn't care about the sort of fields. But, uh, yeah, but in functional programming with strong typing, we don't have it. So, yeah, so I went through it pretty quickly. Uh, I'm pretty much done. I just wanted to show you some syntax examples of Ermine, the language, right? And I don't have time for to show you pure script consequence, which is the library that I'm building in pure script, which does the same thing, because pure script is a language which already has book types, right? So, yeah, so I'm gonna just gonna show you some of Ermine examples of what we do with it. Uh, so, you can define relations in the code, or you can access some database table. It's up to you. Uh, so, you here I'm defining it in the code itself, it's a table literal you can say, right? It has a name column, a favorite color column, and I have to define fields uh, which I can use in tables later on. So I define fields separately, I define the table schema, this is the table schema. And then I can say, I have a function called tabular, right? Which takes any table, displays it in, a, in an independent format, so it could we can later on write it into a PDF file, we can later on write it into an Excel file, we can write it to a CSV, we can write it to an HTML table. Uh, the thing that it generates is independent of the actual output format. And then we take that output format, which is called a report, and produce either PDF, Excel, whatever. Right? So this tabular function is able to do this because of row types. It can take any schema and generate uh, an independent format out of it. So you can do it twice, right? Uh, where some employees is this thing. Oh, I don't know, I must have missed it. So I defined some employees here also, which is basically taking this and filtering it on something, right? So, anyways. And then we have a function for a deep flow that takes two separate reports and then join them together vertically. Right, so we have a very generic layout language that depends on row types. Uh, here's an example of that parent thing that I was talking about. Uh, if you have a table with a parent ID, with a node ID and a parent ID, and some information, right? You can, and then you have some more information attached to the data here. Then you can join them together using just one line. Look how concise the code is. You have a table here, you have a table here. This is so much nicer to read than SQL, right? Here, what I'm saying is that you take value data, join it with hierarchy. It's just a join, but is it much nicer than writing select start from this, where this, blah blah blah, doing all those things. Uh, oh, and this is the same as hash, so it might be confusing. But your script uses hash, or mine uses this, uh, and these are the types. So metric in the end, this is all inferred. Metric in the end will have value, parent ID and node ID, right? Because it determines what the columns are going to be. Uh, and then, uh, this is the cool thing, we have functional aggregate. Remember I told you that what if you wanted to add all the ages of all the descendants, right? So you can define a general purpose function called aggregate. Give it a summing function, an aggregation function of some kind. So here we're saying you want to sum the values, right? And aggregate that over the entire report data. Right, and get a table like this, which has the aggregated values. Right, and here, uh, okay, next slide. And then you can pass it to a function called printout table, which will take those aggregated values and produce nice intended stuff to them. Okay, so it, this can be automatically used to produce PDFs, Excels, uh, CSVs, whatever. Right, so it's output format independent. But we have a generic function called printdown table that can do that. Right? So if you had to generate, this is like an end-to-end -end workflow. If you had to generate some data from a bunch of tables, process them, generate Excel or PDF out of it, right? This is literally the five lines that can do it for you. Right? That's that's the advantage you get. Because of the abstractions, this is a very high-level function. 
uh, aggregate is also a very high level function. You can combine them together in a very easy manner. Right? So imagine a new person coming to your team, writing this code, right? and knowing that this will have no bugs because it's literally like two lines of code. Right? Whereas a new person coming in, writing SQL from scratch. Right? So that's what uh, Ermine and type safe SQL and PureScript consequences are likely that I'm writing, which does this in PureScript. It's still beginning. Uh, it's I've just started writing it. Uh, I'm doing it in my spare time, so it's kind of slow going. But yeah, once we have that, that PureScript runs on the client side. It combines JavaScript, but you can also run it on server side with Node. So you can have like seamless communication between client side and server side. All those things. So. Yeah. Uh, let's thank the speaker. Thank you guys. Uh, and the uh, relay questions. Yes.